Children, you are dismissed if you will follow the lovely lady in the polka dot top. Uh, Randall, sit tight. I'm going to talk about mothers today, so I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you that we're taking a detour from our, our trip through 1 John, but we will get right back into it next week. A little girl asked her mom, how did the human race appear? And the mom answered, well, God made Adam and Eve, and they had children, and so all mankind was made. And two days later, the girl asked her dad the same question, and Dad answered, well, many years ago there were monkeys from which the human race evolved. The confused girl returned to her mom and said, Mom, how is it possible that you told me the human race was created by God and Dad said they developed from monkeys? And the mother answered, well, dear, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family and your father told you about his side. Seems to be a fair explanation. <laughs> Today is Mother's Day, and it's interesting. Our, our, I don't know how to say it. Our world just gets weirder and weirder. Uh, now you don't say mother, it's birthing person. Are you serious? Yeah, I honestly wonder, do people actually hear the stupid when it comes out of their mouths anymore? It, it's, it's really getting ridiculous birthing person. I can imagine being upstairs in the house growing up. Oh, birthing person! Really? Today is Mother's Day. It is, and, and certainly it is a man-made holiday. It's something that, uh, you know, we don't, I, there's no chapter and verse for thou shalt set, up, set aside a particular day and honor motherhood and give her cards and make sure that she does not cook that day and take her someplace nice, and so on and so forth. Some of the guys are like, oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to cook today? What do I do? <laughs> Go to a restaurant, find one quick. Um, the holiday might be man-made, but motherhood is not man-made. It is ordained by God. And that's something that our weirder and weirder society needs to be reminded of. Motherhood is a godly thing. Motherhood is a God-ordained thing, and it ought not to be messed with. It is a wonderful privilege bestowed upon women by God himself. No, I'm not saying that uh, mothers don't have those moments where they don't feel so blessed. I'm sure, you, <laughs> I'm sure you have moments where you say, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> and yet... You have those moments where you say, well, how blessed I am to have the children that God has given me. Our society has gone nuts, but we need to understand motherhood is a God-ordained thing, a privilege that comes from God. We're, we're going to go to the Word of God this morning and look at an example of a, a godly mother, and that example is Hannah. Now, I can t I mean, I don't know how many pulpits will be preaching about Hannah today? I imagine quite a few. Uh, this seems to be the, one of the main texts that someone will go to in preaching a, a Mother's Day. I've actually preached on this, on this sermon, on this passage before, a completely different sermon, so we'll see how this one goes. I'm not going to tell you what happened in the other one. You just use your imagination. All right? Here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 through 7. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman and said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. 
Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. This godly woman wanted to be a mom in the worst kind of way. I mean, she was intent on being a, a mother uh, some, some moms are surprised that they became a mom. Some uh, don't handle that as necessarily the, uh, the, the blessing they were looking forward to. But Hannah is one of these women who wanted to be a mom in the worst kind of way. And this godly woman demonstrates for us an excellent example. We see three things in this text. She prayed, she prepared, and she praised and I, I know that any time I preach about motherhood, well, for one, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage and that I'm not one, so it's, there's, there's always that. And then there's other people in the room who are also not mothers. So, boy, do, do I get to just kind of uh, snooze the rest of the sermon because this isn't for me? No, you do not. This is for everybody. Her example is an example. We see in her approach to motherhood a great example for how we all should live our lives as a godly woman. She demonstrates wonderful principles for all of us. So I'm, I'm sorry that nap is going to have to wait just a, a little longer. Right after the dinner that you prepare for your wife, then you can take that nap. After you've cleaned the dishes. All right. We find here, first of all, that Hannah... Now, that may seem simplistic, but it's worth noting that Hannah wanted to be a mother, and the first thing she did is she prayed. And I don't care what it is that you desire in your life, the direction that you want in your life, things that you were looking, what ought you to do? What, what should be the very first thing you do? You go to the Lord in prayer. I don't know how many times people view prayer as the last resort. Well, I've done everything else, so I guess I might as well pray. Right? People will say things like that. Or, you know, all I can't do, I, I'm really sorry. All, all I, I'm sorry. All I can do is pray. All you can do. All you can do. That's the best thing you could possibly do. Engage the, the eternal creator and, and have him be involved in bringing his power into the situation. That's the, that's the best thing you could possibly do. Everything else should be secondary to that. Hannah wants to be a mom. And so what does she do? She prays. James 4, verse 2 says, you do not have. Why? Because you do not ask. How many times do we deprive ourselves because we haven't bothered going to the throne, recognizing that he invites us to come and bring our needs to him? You do not have because you do not ask. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God. It's almost like we sang that this morning or something. Right? The most important, the most effective thing that we can do is come to the Lord in prayer. James 5.16 says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
Hannah knew that the one place she could go is to the Lord. She knew that he would listen to her. Even if she didn't get the answer she wanted, she was still going to go to him in prayer. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. We all ought to be people of prayer. And the reality is we may pr pray and receive the answer that we want. We may pray and receive an answer that we didn't expect. How many times in your life have you looked back and said, I can remember praying that to the Lord and I wanted this and I was, I was convinced that this was the direction I should go. This is the thing that I wanted and needed and, and, God, and God answered differently. And God said, no, child, this is what I have for you. And you look back after time goes by and you say, boy, I'm sure glad that he gave me what he decided I should have instead of what I thought I wanted. He truly does know best. Even though at that very moment we think this is what I need, this is what I should have, we might even say something like this is what I deserve. <laughs> we don't want what we deserve. <laughs> we want his grace. We, we want his kindness. We want his mercy. But certainly, Hannah knew the direction to go to the Lord. That's the place to go. If, if I'm going to be a mom at all, it's going to be because of his gracious working and, and involvement in my life. And so I'm going to go to him. She didn't know if the Lord would give her a child or not, but she knew he was the one to make it happen. 1 Peter 5, 7. I, absolutely one of my favorite verses in all Scripture. Casting all our anxieties on him because he cares for you. And I love how it says all your anxieties, every last one of them. What do people do when they have anxiety? Well, I, I, there's a medication for that. Or they self-medicate with something else. You, you try to drink your anxieties away, you realize once you run out of stuff to drink that you're only delaying the problem. Where are we supposed to cast our anxieties? To the Lord. Why? Because he cares. Because he has an answer. I am so thankful. I, I have never brought anything to the Lord. And he says, now listen, you just stop wasting my time. That's trivial and I don't care. Nope, that's not his response. And he also doesn't respond, now that's too big. I can't handle that. He doesn't respond to that. Rather, he invites us to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. What an encouragement this morning. That's an encouragement for us. It was an encouragement to Hannah. She knew that she could cast this anxiety on him, and that's exactly what she did. And we know that it was some pretty high-level anxiety. Here she is praying at the temple, and even the priest thought she must be drunk. How many of you have done that? You've come to church and you prayed and, and, and the pastor thought you were drunk. I'm just, never mind. You don't. If that's you this morning, you do not have to answer that question. 1 Samuel 1, 15 and 16, Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation what do you do when you're overwhelmed i mean some of us have gone through some pretty intense stuff i know that for knowing some of your situations you've gone through some life stuff that was pretty intense pretty heavy stuff where do you go when you're overwhelmed well i want to encourage you go directly to the lord make no detours <laughs> before you call and talk to anybody, and I'm not saying don't call and talk, I'm not saying that, but before you do, where do you go first? Go right to the Lord. Go right to the one who has an answer, who cares, who has compassion, and has an answer for your need. Go directly to him. Hannah was speaking here out of great anxiety and vexation. Where does she go? Directly to the Lord. What a godly woman. There's a story that early African converts to Christianity were earnest and regular in private devotions. Each one reportedly had a separate spot in the thicket where he would pour out his heart to God. Over time, the paths to these places became well-worn. As a result, if one of these believers began to neglect prayer, it was soon apparent to the others, and they would kindly remind the negligent one, Brother, the grass grows on your path. 
When you're overwhelmed, let me ask you, is there grass growing on your path? Or have you so well-worn that path that it, there's, it's a no-brainer? I, I just found out thus and such, I'm going straight, I'm going straight to the Lord. I was going there anyway, but now I'm, I'm going to bring that need to him because I know that he has an answer for me. When we are overwhelmed, we need to go directly to the Lord. Hannah prayed, full of vexation and anxiety, so overwhelmed with this desire to be a mother, and God answered. The second thing we see in this text is that Hannah prepared. Now, Hannah makes this vow to the Lord. She promises to give her child to the Lord and to his service if he would allow her to simply conceive and give birth to a child. I wonder how many women would make that kind of a vow today. I will, Lord, if you allow me to have a child, I will give that child to you and whatever you want to do with that child. What I don't want is somebody showing up and dropping their kid off. Here you go, Pastor. Can you, can you maybe raise them at your house and still bring them on Sundays? Uh, we're trying to get rid of kids. Sorry, Josh. You back there? I keep hearing about that wonderful thing called empty nest. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I love you, son, back there. Hannah makes this vow to the Lord, promising to give this child. And it's, it's incredible. Here she is. She wants a child so badly, and she says, if you give me this child, I'm going to give him back to you. Isn't that incredible? What a woman. I mean, this is not your average woman here. This is a godly woman. And what an example. She, she, she wants to have a child so badly, yet she's willing to give him up to the Lord says here that she weaned him and then brought him to the Lord. Uh, verse 23 in our text says, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Boy, that's a smart husband right there. You know? Is that, is that something you, you, you guys say to your wife a lot? Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Then uh, chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. During those few years that Hannah had Samuel at her home, I can just imagine the love that she gave that little boy while she had him. She knew every day was precious. She knew that it, the time was going to come soon when it was time to bring him and give him to the Lord's service at the temple there. I still have memories, uh, believe it or not, of my mother uh, in my dad's recliner holding me as a little boy and, and the time that I spent with my mom. Very special. Imagine this woman. Imagine Hannah and those those treasured times that she had holding her son and talking to him. Samuel became a great prophet before the Lord. You think that happened accidentally? I don't think so. I think that godly woman poured as much of the knowledge of God into that boy as she possibly could. I bet you she told him every single day, hey, I cried out to God for you, and here you are. You're a blessing. I am sure that Samuel's confidence in God as one who answers prayer came from his mother and her example and her instruction to him, even at a very, very young age. Some people act as if some, well, someday, maybe when my kid's in, the, in their 30s, they can understand the Lord. Are you kidding me? If they can talk about anything else, you can talk to them about the Lord. Absolutely. It's interesting. I've sometimes said that I was born in revival because literally my, we were having a revival meeting at the, my dad's church and my mother was, was holding on to the pew in front of her. Her knuckles were white, you know, because she was going into labor. So she, had, she literally left the revival service to go give birth. Anyway, um, you think about Hannah and how she prepared that boy to go and be that prophet before God. 
she prepared him and told him all about the Lord that he would be serving. And not only did she spend time preparing Samuel for a life of ministry, she also had to prepare her own heart for letting him go. And that couldn't have been an easy thing. I'm not a mom. But I have enough sense in my head to know that must have been really hard for that woman to prepare her heart to let him go. Right? Now, I I think many Christian moms go wrong in this area. They don't want to give their children completely to the Lord. I mean, after all, what if God calls my son to, to be a missionary in a foreign land? Well, what if he does? What a blessing that would be. What an honor that would be. All things belong to the Lord, even our children. If we truly grasp that, if we truly understand that that God owns everything, I give my life to him, he owns everything, including my children, including everything he's blessed me with, it belongs to him. They're in the, they're in the Lord's hands. And Hannah gave her son to the Lord, and that means that God's will was more important than Hannah's will. Our children need to be given to the Lord. It's our job as parents to raise our children to know and to love God. And I want you to hear me on a few things here. Your child might love to do things like play baseball. They may love music. They may, they may play an instrument. They may be involved in some other activity. And all those things are fine. But the world's going to tempt you to promote those ambitions in your child's life to the exception of godly instruction. And if you take that bait, you failed. Because your first and foremost job as a mom is to do what? To raise your children to know and love Jesus Christ. That's your number one priority. There's going to come a day when many parents will say, I wish I had insisted on my children knowing the Lord more than knowing sports or music or whatever else it is. You say, Pastor, where are you getting this nonsense? Just Scripture. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It doesn't mean that sports are irrelevant and, and they're bad. They're not, it's nothing bad or evil about sports. But a, but a mother who prioritizes sports over, over a relationship with God has made a mistake. Interesting statistic. There is a 0.0296% chance that your child will become a professional athlete. But there is a 100% chance that your child will stand before God. How tragic would it be that your kid can hit a fastball, but hears someday the words from the eternal throne, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Tragic. Moms, your first job is what? Raise your child to know Christ. There's no greater calling. There's no higher calling you could possibly have. And Hannah had to prepare her heart, had to prepare his heart, that you're going to belong to the Lord. And while you may not take your child to the temple and make a little robe for him every year like Hannah did, (laughs) every mother can dedicate their children to the Lord. Every mother can say, This child belongs to the Lord. And whatever happens in that child's life, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. If they go to hell, it won't be because of me. It won't be be on me that I never told them about salvation in Jesus Christ. Sorry to get a little intense on you this morning. But that's reality. And Hannah was a godly mother. She prepared her child to know the Lord. And godly moms to this day continue to do the same. They say, this child is a gift. I'm going to give that child to the Lord's care. It's difficult to prepare our children to belong to the Lord. Our our culture will fight us at every turn. You you look at the, the schedules of when sports gather. Oh, Sunday mornings. Let's have baseball practice. Let's have whatever. Drives me nuts. And so now everybody has to compete with that. Now, I will say I was pastoring a church in Massachusetts, and the, the priest in town of the Catholic church had had enough of it. And he got everybody that went to his church, and we got all the other churches involved, and the parents basically said to all the coaches, you have a practice on Sunday morning, we're not coming. 
And so the town actually changed it to that after 12 noon they could have uh, sports. I, I think it might be time for some Christian parents to get up and say, you know what, enough of this, enough of this. We don't mind having sports. Sports are great, but we we'll need to have them a little later in the day. Not a bad idea. My son, I can remember years ago, he, he was going to, I don't know if you remember this, Josh. You were a young one. He was going to play football. I was all excited. I figured I had a linebacker for sure. I was going to help coach. And I asked him when, they, uh, when, when the practices and all that were. And I said, Sunday mornings. And I said, yep, well, we're not doing that. So <laughs> uh, sometimes we do make sacrifices. But the sacrifices we ought to make ought to be on the side of righteousness, not on the side of the world. Those are tough choices to make. I get it. And sports are not bad, but there's nothing more important than raising your child to know Christ. All right. Anybody ready for me to go to the next point? Here we go. She praised. 1 Samuel 1, 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. And then uh, chapter 2, verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now, I love the fact that Scripture records Hannah's praise to the Lord for her answered prayer. She prayed for a child. The Lord gave her what she prayed for. How many times do you think people pray to the Lord and they ask and God answers and they forget to say, thank you, praise you, Lord? Yeah, it's amazing to me. I, I, I constantly think of the story. You know, Jesus heals the ten lepers, right? Remember that? <laughs> you think of COVID, social distancing, six feet? Not for lepers. You were completely outcast out of society, period. And not only was it a, a debilitating disease that, that ate away at their, at their body, but, but they were outcasts from the rest of society. Jesus heals these ten lepers. You'd think they would just be declaring his praises all over the place and thanking him again. And it says they walked away, and of the ten, one came back to say thank you and praise the Lord. Um, and Jesus says, weren't there ten? <laughs> Where's the other nine? What's going on here? And, and we say, well, you know, that's... That's not normal. I mean, society is a very thankful people. Man is generally thankful. No, we don't say that, do we? In fact, we're probably not even that surprised. And as, a, as uh, the mothers here today, how many times have you had to tell your child, make sure to say thank you to so-and-so for the whatever, right? You have, to actually, you have to remind your kids to say thank you. Why? Because they don't necessarily think to say thank you. We seem to be lacking in the uh, thank you department. We seem to be lacking in the praise department, giving God praise for the things that he has done. In Romans 1, the Apostle Paul speaks about the wrath of God upon mankind. And one of it's interesting as we look at this, one of the primary things that God's wrath comes upon mankind for is what? God reveals himself to mankind, his goodness, the things that he has made, all that he has done. And what does man do? Refuses to give God thanks for what he's done. Let's look at it. Romans 1, 20 and 21, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Interestingly, what indicts mankind is they received the goodness of God's creation but did not honor God or thank Him. No praise. Just took advantage of what they received. But a godly mother is one who recognizes that her children are a gift from God Himself. She views each one as a gift and as a reason to give praise and thanks to God. I, I'm, I'm sure that Hannah would have agreed with what James said in James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The good gift of your child is a gift from God himself. 
Hannah praised God. She knew that Samuel was a gift that came from him. And we can learn from this godly mother that it is good for us to praise God for everything that we receive from his bountiful hand. In conclusion, Randall, you didn't know if you're going to make it this far, but you have. Here we are. Hannah prayed. When you're overwhelmed, when you're troubled, when you are filled with anxiety, where do you go? You can go to the Lord in prayer. He's not your second place to go, not your third place. He's not your last resort. He's the first place you need to go. When you're overwhelmed, troubled, filled with any anxiety of any variety, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Secondly, Hannah prepared. Recognize that the highest priority you have is to give your child to the Lord. Prepare them for that fact and prepare yourself. That this child needs to know the Lord. I need to give my child to him. And, and any ideas of what I would think for the future of that child, what I ought to think is the most important direction for that child to walk is in righteousness, in relationship with Jesus Christ. Hannah praised. God answered her prayer. And, and, and the reality is no matter what God's answer, God still deserves the praise because his will is always best, isn't it? Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And so we give him honor and thanksgiving, just like Hannah did in her great example of the godly mother and the godly woman that she was. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the encouragement as well as the challenge that it gives to our hearts. Help us to be people of prayer who go to you in all things. Help us to be people, Lord, who prepare our hearts and the hearts of our children to know you. And help us to be people of praise. Help us to be thankful and grateful people. You have blessed us with so much. We do praise you and honor you this morning, Lord. We thank you for mothers. And Lord, I do ask, Lord, your blessing on each mother. And thank you so much for each mother that's here. And thank you for your working in their lives. Just ask that you would encourage them and help them and empower them by your Holy Spirit to continue to be that godly example to others. In Christ's name we pray.